clear for launch. And with that, shut down your visors. O2 on and prepare for ignition to O2. Copy that and um Hey there, Mr. Rushoff again. All right, in our last lesson, we talked about how convection currents within the Earth create continental drift and plate tectonics. We can call these the internal factors that shape the Earth as they happen inside the Earth. In this lesson, we're going to look at how the Earth can be shaped from the outside, namely by the effects of weather and climate or the external factors. Now, these external factors are erosion, weathering, and deposition. And we'll also take a few moments to talk about how soil is created as well. Now, these external factors all start with weathering. Weathering is essentially the process of breaking rocks into smaller rocks, doing into smaller rocks, into even smaller rocks, until you get something called sediment. The sediment is essentially these small rocks and mud, silt, and gravel that has been worn down by this weathering process. And there are two major types of weathering. There is physical weathering and chemical weathering. When you think about physical weathering, think that this is essentially where Mother Nature takes a crowbar to be able to break apart rocks. Except instead of using a crowbar, Mother Nature uses water, heat, ice, salt, and plants. Here is an example of physical weathering I saw when I was in Iceland. And at first glance, it almost looks like this is a bunch of rocks. But if you look closer, you see that this used to be a rock face, but physical weathering has begun to break it into smaller parts. Now, this process usually begins with single small cracks. And these small cracks can be created by the stress of the heat of the sun or when water is actually absorbed into a rock, which makes it absorb a little bit. It'll, it'll start to create cracks. Now, salt water in areas near the ocean may also create these small cracks when salt is actually deposited onto the rocks, the salt crystals will expand, kind of prying the rocks apart. Now, these are all examples of physical weathering. Now, once we have these small cracks, something called ice wedging may occur. This happens when water from rain or melting snow will start to fill up those cracks. And then what happens is when the temperature drops, the water will freeze into ice. Now, we know that when water freezes, it expands. So this water in the crack will expand and serve as a wedge, breaking the rocks apart wider and wider. Now, this cycle will continue for thousands of years until the rock is really left in several different pieces, such as this boulder here in Iceland. But vegetation could also play a part. Plants will often grow into the cracks of a rock. And as their roots will basically force their way into the crack, it'll start to ply the crack even wider. Now, these are all forms of physical weathering. And while physical weathering is essentially taking a crowbar to break the rocks apart, we have chemical weathering, which is going to break down the rock by changing the actual chemical composition of the rock. And perhaps the easiest example of chemical weathering to understand is rust. Rust occurs when oxygen reacts with iron, slowly breaking down the metal in the process. This is called oxidation, and it can happen to rocks. In fact, if you look at pictures of the American Southwest, you'll notice the red color those are the rocks. This is a sign of oxidation occurring in the iron found in the rocks, turning them red while also very slowly weathering them down. Chemical weathering of limestone is also easy to see. When carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere combines with water, it will create a chemical reaction with the limestone that literally eats away the rock. Human activity has also contributed to chemical weathering. Air pollution may combine with water vapor in the atmosphere to create what is called acid rain. When it rains, this acid chemical compound will eat away at rocks such as these here in Scotland. So weathering breaks down rock into sediment through physical and chemical weathering. When sediment is moved, this is called erosion. Erosion is caused by wind, water, ice, and even gravity whenever the energy of these forms are strong enough to be able to pick up and move the sediment. We'll start our conversation about erosion with wind erosion. Now, if you've ever been outside and a big gust of wind blows sand in your eyes, quite frankly, that's sand erosion. Of course, the wind has to be strong enough to pick up the sand or dust, or in other words, the sediment. Now, it's most common to find wind erosion in flat areas such as deserts and beaches where the sediment is exposed and there isn't anything to block the wind. Areas with vegetation, however, tend to have less wind erosion because trees will block the wind and the roots of the plants tend to hold onto the sediment, preventing the wind from being able to pick it up and move it. However, when drought is combined with farmlands and pastures being overused in bad agricultural practices, the roots of the grass are no longer able to counteract to the force of wind erosion and the soil can be literally swept away. This is what happened in the Great Plains from northern Texas up to Canada in 1930s. A severe drought and poor farming techniques left fertile topsoil exposed to the wind. 
Then winds came and created what people called black blizzards of dust that would reduce visibility to just a few feet and carry dust as far as New York. In 1934, a dust storm from the Great Plains dumped 12 million pounds of dust on Chicago, Illinois. Now, in the wake of the Dust Bowl, farmers would begin to change their farming methods. One example would be to grow hedgerows around the fields so that the trees would actually block the winds to be able to prevent this type of wind erosion to occur in the future. Then we have water erosion. Ocean waves beating against the coastline will take the sediment out to sea. This is an example of water erosion, as is the erosion we see with streams and rivers. Now, if you doubt the power of water to erode, take a look at the Grand Canyon, which was formed by the erosion of the Colorado River. Through erosion, rivers will cut either canyons such as this one or V-shaped valleys. Then there are glaciers. A glacier is a large mass of ice that flows slowly over the Earth's surface, and they can be huge. The Lambert Glacier in Antarctica is the world's largest glacier. It is more than 60 miles wide, 270 miles long, and almost 2 miles thick. Large glaciers in the world weigh so much that they can actually deform the Earth's crust due to the compression due to their high weight. So you can imagine that these glaciers are able to move a great deal of not only sediment, but large rocks and boulders as they inch slowly towards lower elevations. Now, due to their size, they will cut U-shaped valleys along the way. And the material that is pushed to the side by the glaciers is called moraine, which can create hills surrounding the valley. The bigger the glacier, the bigger these moraines can be. For example, Cape Cod, Massachusetts was created as part of the moraine from the Laurentide ice sheet that covered most of North America some 20,000 years ago. And throughout New England, you will find large boulders that were moved by the same Laurentide ice sheet. Now, the fourth major cause of erosion is gravity. Rock faces are constantly being weathered by chemical and physical weathering. Now, over time, the rock is no longer able to win its fight against gravity, and the gravity will take over, pulling rocks down, such as this rock slide in Switzerland. Now, mudslides are also examples of erosion by gravity. In areas with lots of rainfall, the water will soften the soil, causing the ground to release to the power of gravity. So you can have erosion by wind, water, ice, and gravity. But let's be clear here, erosion does not break down rocks, it just moves sediment. And weathering breaks down rock into sediment, but it does not move it. Then there is deposition. Deposition occurs whenever the force eroding the sediment no longer has the energy to continue carrying a sediment. Let me explain. A river needs to be flowing more than about a quarter mile an hour in order to move a grain of sand. And winds need to be blowing faster than about 12 and a half miles an hour to be able to pick up and move sediment. So once the speed of the wind or the river drops below these thresholds, it will begin to drop the sediment that is carrying. This is called deposition. A great example of deposition is the creation of river deltas. Normally, the Mississippi River flows at about 1.2 miles per hour. However, as it moves into the Gulf of Mexico, it slows down, it loses its energy, and it deposits sediment. And what will happen is it will create what is known as a delta. Now, visible examples of wind deposition are the sand dunes. The great sand dunes were actually created when a prehistoric lake dried up. The winds then started to pick up the sand and carry them toward the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, where the wind started to slow down, dropping the sand, creating the sand dunes. But it's not just sand that is deposited by the wind. In Europe, the North European plain has some of the most fertile lands in the entire continent. Contributing to this fertility was the wind depositing a fertile sediment known as loess across the plain. In some cases, wind erosion dumped over 100 meters of this dry but very fertile soil on the area. And you can understand how important soil is to human development and human settlement as it is where we farm our food. And what is soil? Well, it's dirt, right? Well, yeah, but there's more to it. Soil actually is a combination of four things. Sediment, which is why deposition is so important, air, water, and organic material. And when we talk about organic material, we're talking about decaying plants and animals. This can be manure, leaves, decomposing animals, essentially anything that used to be alive but no longer is. Also known as humus, this is not to be confused with the Middle Eastern bean paste hummus. Humus is important because it is what actually provides the fertility to the soil for plants to be able to grow. 
Now, in addition to sediment, air, water, and organic material, or humus, there is one other thing that is needed, and that is time. It can take some 3,000 years for enough sediment or organic material to accumulate to bake at least one centimeter soil. And in mild climates, it can take anywhere between two to 400 years for these four components to actually combine into soil, although in tropical wet areas, it can take only about 200 years though. Now, while deposition plays a major part in transporting material to be able to create soil, it also contributes to the process of creating rock, namely sedimentary rock. As sediment is deposited over a long period of time, anywhere between thousands of years to millions of years, a process called lithification takes place. Lithification is a process in which the material is buried by other material, and then a chemical reaction of the sediment, water, or organic material bond the sediment all together. This is actually called cementation. Sandstone is a perfect example of a sedimentary rock. This occurs in areas where it was once covered by sand. In fact, underneath the Sahara Desert, we actually find sandstone. But we can see sedimentary rock not only of sediment, but also of organic material such as decayed plants and shells of ancient sea life. The process works the same way, but produces different types of sedimentary rock. In the case of seashells from ancient sea life, we can get limestone, and ancient plants is actually what creates coal. Now, what is interesting is the same external forces of weathering erosion are also applied to the sedimentary rock as part of what is called the rock cycle. All right, we've learned the external factors that shape our earth, which are weathering, which break down rocks into smaller rocks or sediment, erosion that moves the sediment, and deposition that drops that sediment down to earth. And we've also looked at how soil and sedimentary rocks are formed. All right, until our next lesson, keep on learning.